If you're just joining us, um, we will be getting started in just a minute. You can check your audio device um, and we will be starting in just a minute. All right, we will get started. Welcome to Penn State Berks Lionside Chats. My name is uh, Ryan Hassler. I'm one of the three Lionside Chat moderators working alongside Don Pfeiffer Wrights and Sonia De La Cueto. Come on in and welcome to our campus. We are so glad that you could join us today. Before we get started, we wanted to share that you should please feel free to submit questions throughout the entire program via the question and answer feature. Uh, we will not be utilizing the uh, raised hand feature during this session um, either. Once the presentation concludes, we will facilitate a discussion with our presenter. We will also be recording today's session so you can visit uh, and revisit the topic or even share that experience with friends and family. So now we are excited to introduce to you um, Dr. Joseph Mahoney. Um, Dr. Mahoney is an associate professor of mechanical engineering and kinesiology at Penn State Berks. Um, his research involves biomechanics, applied machine learning, nonlinear systems, and video gaming. Um, today, his talk will be around simulating infectious disease spread with an SIR model. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Mahoney. I would invite you, Joe, to share your screen, and uh, we look forward to your talk. All right, thank you. Uh, let me make sure this works here. All right, I think everything's working here. All right, thank you for uh, the introduction, uh, Dr. Hassler. So today I want to talk about, uh, well, this is the short title here, SIR modeling, uh, I'm specifically with MATLAB. But right, more generally, I'm going to be talking about uh, modeling infectious disease spread uh, using MATLAB as the programming language. But kind of the bigger ideas uh, is what I'm going to address in just kind of showing a simple model and then talking about how we can also expand upon it. All right, so Dr. Hassler gave me a, a nice introduction here. Uh, but I, I teach primarily in uh, mechanical engineering. So I teach system dynamics, mechanical vibration statics, uh, computer programming, specifically MATLAB. Uh, my research is focused in biomechanics, uh, applied machine learning, uh, things like that. Uh, and I am going to be showing my work uh, using MATLAB because that's what I'm used to working in, but nothing I'm going to be talking about is MATLAB specific. So I am going to be showing some MATLAB code uh, during this presentation, but I'm going to be talking at a much higher level, hopefully, um, uh, of just broadly, how is the program working? What are the assumptions I'm making? What's the methods I'm using? Um, any code you might be interested in afterwards, I'd be willing to share, um, but I, I won't go through all the details uh, in the, of the code itself. All right, so some disclaimers before we start. Uh, so I chose to present on this topic of infectious disease modeling. Uh, after looking at some of the other, what the other presenters were doing uh, during these sessions, uh, seemed to be themed around obviously COVID-19, coronavirus being the, the theme of the, of the time here. So I decided I want to also present uh, around that same theme. So as a first disclaimer, I am not an epidemiologist. I won't claim to be. I'm not a real doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, I have a PhD in engineering. So I am not going to be trying to make any uh, large assertions or claims or claim expertise outside of uh, modeling here. I'm using, as I'll go through a lot of assumptions uh, as I'm going through the model, not all of them are correct. I'm trying to point out the ones I know not to be correct, but um, a lot of simplifications are going to be made here. Uh, so as I said, many oversimplifications just to make the modeling easier in this limited time frame. Uh, some estimates, some best estimates we have, and some uh, definitely incorrect assumptions are going to be made. So really what I'm trying to show here is how we can program up something pretty short and simple that's gonna really act as a, I'll call it a toy, so that we can explore the idea, the ideas we have in modeling infectious diseases 
and some of the parameter changes we can make and how the model, how the outcomes are going to respond. But uh, again, it's, it's going to be specific to how we're modeling and the assumptions that we're making. So really this SIR model I'll talk about in a little bit uh, in the following slides is really meant to be general to infectious diseases. So those spread from one person to another. Um, and if you look at uh, in the literature, if you look out there at videos on YouTube, people have done SIR modeling. They're doing it now with COVID-19 certainly, uh, but there's, there's a lot out there with um, even like Black Plague back to the uh, 13th, 14th century doing uh, the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic uh, and everything in between smallpox, things like that. So it's, it's a very common general infectious disease model. Uh, I'm going to try to approximate some things as best I can for COVID-19, but as I'll get to uh, some things we just, we really just don't know. All right, so how am I going to uh, run this simulation that we can then explore um, we, we can run it out for some simulated time and explore how changes to the model are going to affect its outcomes. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be using MATLAB uh, to do this just because it's simple to get something running pretty quick. Um, but we can make this model in Python. We can make it in uh, various other languages too. I just, again, find MATLAB the simplest for me to work in to get something running quickly. Uh, I guess a little bit background on why I, why I chose this topic is when I taught my system dynamics course in the spring um, and then we were obviously interrupted around spring break uh, and had to go online. I had a lot of students that were, uh, we, we were doing uh, presentation projects and a lot of students were interested in looking at SIR models since it really fit into the wheelhouse of system dynamics. So three groups I think chose to do different uh, models for that and I started throwing together some stuff myself too based on ideas that they were coming up with and then seeing some things on YouTube, I thought I would just kind of play and make my own model in, in MATLAB and try to explore it. Um, now, if you do look at other models for infectious disease modeling, SIR or others, some of them rely on some fundamental mathematics involved. So some of them have this calculus model, really a differential equations model that they're relying on and they're able to solve that differential equation for the different quantities that we will also be looking at, which I'll, I'll get to in the next bullet point here. The model I'm, I created and we're going to explore does not rely on calculus. It's just going to rely on some basic assumptions and some basic uh, parameters of what I'm going to call agents in the next step. So there are other ways to do this sort of modeling that are more mathematics heavy. This is more, uh, I guess I'll say like intuition based um, but we'll see similar types of results here. Right, so, so what we're going to do is create uh, what I'll refer to as agents. So agents are just people in the model, or they represent people in the model. And there are three statuses that an agent or a person can have in these models. This is where the SDI and the R come from. So an agent can be susceptible, which means they're naive to whatever the infectious disease is, and susceptible people can become infected if they are uh, near someone who is infected. So they go from susceptible and then they can become infected or we'll see that some people start infected as kind of our day zero. Uh, we can have agents that are then infected. So people that are infected can uh, spread the disease to people that are susceptible and it's gonna take some time for infected people to eventually go to the last status which is uh, the R. Uh, now, R has two meanings depending on the model you're looking at. Some of them refer to it as recovered. Uh, others refer to it as removed. I think for the most part, I'm going to use removed here um, because removed includes people that have either been infected and recovered or people that were infected and they died. Uh, and then they are they're removed from the system. So basically the idea of removed is that uh, you go from infected to removed. Removed people cannot infect people that are susceptible and removed people cannot become infected uh, themselves. I'll talk about uh, a little bit about that later. So there's the only three statuses that our agents can have in our model, susceptible, infected, recovered. And they can only go from susceptible to infected to recovered, at least in the model that I'm going to be using. So I'll get to the programming of, of that in a minute, but that's the basic premise of this. Uh, we're gonna track uh, how many agents, what percentage of our agents are S, I, and R as we go through time. 
All right, so here's some uh, admittedly bad assumptions and simplifications, but they're things that in the about 200 lines of code I wrote are simple enough for us to get the idea of what's happening here. Um, but some of them I, I'll admit up front are bad, at least in terms of if we were trying to model COVID-19, a lot of these certainly do not hold up. But I'm not, I'm not trying to present a perfect, um, adapt, a perfect adaptation of COVID-19 or simulation of it. But some of these will apply, some of them will not. So here's some rules for the agents. Uh, so for, again, simplicity, I'm going to set up a, a square area that the agents can move around in. Now, obviously, if we were trying to model uh, know, our city, our campus, our country, our world, uh, well, a square area is pretty bad. Uh, but again, just for uh, this little toy problem, we're just gonna have a square area that our agents can move around in and they have to stay inside our square. We're going to, I'm going to initially distribute our agents just randomly inside this square area. Again, in reality, uh, people, if we were trying to model a city, will people be clustered in homes or grocery stores or schools? government buildings, stadiums, things like that. They would not just be randomly dispersed. So uh, they'll begin randomly dispersed. Uh, I'm also going to seed it with a couple of them. I think I used five in the demonstration today, five of our agents being infected. So this is kind of representing our day zero when we realize, uh-oh, uh, we have people are infected in our area and then we're gonna move time forward from there. And we're going to, I'm gonna assume that the agents move around at random Obviously, again, that's not how people are going to really act. People are going to go from work to home. Maybe they're going to go to some activities. They're not just going to meander around, around randomly, uh, but that for more advanced modeling could be included there. Uh, and we're going to assume that all the agents have the same probability of becoming infected and the same probability of spreading the infection. So I'm not accounting here for differences in age or uh, an immune system, things like that. Um, but again, if we, if we knew the demographics of the area, maybe we could put those into a more advanced model. And uh, the time it takes for someone to go from infected to removed, we're going to say, assume is the same for every agent, uh, that how long it takes for them to recover on average or, 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 uh, or die is going to be the same. We're also going to, in our model, know if and for each agent, are they susceptible, infected, or recovered, removed uh, at any time? I'll talk about the ramifications of that later as it pertains to uh, the current COVID-19. So we have perfect knowledge of the status of every agent that's in our system. And like I talked about before, once an agent becomes removed, we are going to assume they cannot become infected again, they cannot go back to infected, and they cannot spread the infection. Yeah, it's a lot of setup here, but we're going to see in a minute the, the basic code that's going to make the simple model that we can then explore. Uh, we're going to, uh, up, up front, I'm going to say I'm making up to some extent the infection rate. Uh, I'll talk about how I am modeling the infection rate. We really don't know what it is. We don't have a good number for the current disease. And really it changes for any disease as time goes on. As, uh, so it's kind of tough to see what's the natural infection rate anyway. So I'm going to use, I believe, 70%, but specifically I'll, see, I'll show you how that 70% factors in. Uh, and we also don't necessarily know the true uh, average recovery time. So I am really just making it up for this theoretical model disease uh, that we're going to be going through. So I'll show the parameters of that. But for the real disease, if we wanted to model it, these things are not exactly uh, known at the moment. All right, so that was a lot of preamble. Now I'll uh, switch over to MATLAB for a second and look at the baseline simulation I'm running. All right, so here's MATLAB if you've not seen it before. Uh, again, the details of it are not too uh, important. If you actually are interested in the code later, uh, then you can contact me. I, d I won't go through all the gory details of it here. But basically, I am going to make this box that I'm putting our agents in. For this simulation, I'm going to, just for a nice round number, and so the percentages are easy, I'm going to fill it with 100 agents. Uh, I'm going to uh, distribute them randomly inside this square, and then randomly on what I'm going to call day zero, infect five of them. Uh, and then I'm going to turn the crank and let every day go on. Um, okay, so. 
what I have here, this might be um, for at least the virus or the infection I'm modeling here, I'm going to assume that it takes, once you contract it, once you're infected, it takes on average 20 days to recover with a standard deviation of 1.5 days. So for the statistics folks out there, I'm going to just model our recovery as coming from a normal distribution of an, a mean of 20 days, a standard deviation of 1.5. For COVID specifically, I, I didn't, I'm not sure what those numbers, the best estimates of those numbers are right now, uh, but we could change these parameters pretty easy. Uh, I'm going to set the infection radius to 0 0.05. Uh, so this is just saying for this model, how close do you have, does a susceptible person have to be to an infected person to have a chance of contracting, to becoming infected themselves? And for this, I'm going to use an infection rate, uh, actually to, mount, to match the other model, I'll change that to 0.7. I'm going to assume for this that if a susceptible person is within 0 0.05, as we see the units in a minute, the 0 0.05 of an infected person, they will have a 70% chance of contracting the, uh, the infection. So this is probably high um, for, and this is assuming no sort of precautions taking place. This is what the baseline is talking about. So 70% chance. Again, not trying to model perfectly the current situation here. All right, so I'm going to model this out for uh, 180 days. Uh, so basically on any day, an agent is going to move. It's going to check uh, if we're infected. Are you within some radius of someone who's susceptible? And then it's going to randomly, uh, with some probability, infect someone who's susceptible. Who, and they go from susceptible to now infected. And then we go to the next day. Again, there's a lot of uh, simplification here because you don't just walk one step every day. Someone's around you, they get infected. But we could have toned this down. We could have changed the time scale to something that's more minute by minute or hour by hour if we wanted. Um, but this will get the point across, hopefully. All right, so on every tick, on every day, we see, we see who's infected and possibly infect the susceptible people near them. Also, we check for the infected and we see uh, how much, how long they've been infected and there's a chance then they'll go from infected to removed. They either are recovered and now they are now uh, under R. And then every day I'm going to keep track of how many of the agents are susceptible, infected, and recovered. All right, so that's the very basic setup here. So I think looking at the running this now, we can see what's actually going on. All right, so the red dots are the agents that are infected, black dots are those that are uh, susceptible. And what you'll see is as time goes on, so every movement here, it's a little tough to see, is a day going by in the simulation. So we see green now, green are the removed or the recovered uh, people. So as time goes on, uh, we see that as the black dots get close to red dots on occasion, they are gonna switch over to being a red dot. Sometimes they'll avoid it. And so we see here, uh, these two in the corner, just by chance in this model, uh, avoided uh, being infected. Uh, it got rid of the little screen there. Uh, but I'll run it another time too. I'll make this big for the moment. All right, so what this is showing here in red is what percentage, well, because I used 100 agents, it's also how many agents on any day were infected versus how many were susceptible, and then eventually they start to be recovered uh, as time goes by. Again, on day zero, no one can be recovered because no one has already had a recovered from the, from the infection or the virus in this case. So we get here in this baseline example, this uh, actually really nice curve it turned out in this case, where we see the red has a peak value of about, oh, it says here, um, in, yeah, it's not giving me the exact amount, it's a little bit tough to see from here, about 65% if we say over. So a peak in our population, 65% of our population was infected on the worst day. Uh, and we see by the end, this went on for about 65 days, the number of people that were recovered, so we see that infected eventually went to zero in the model, and the recovered went up to, let's say about 95%. So in this baseline model, by the time the no one was infected anymore and the virus kind of burnt out, 95% of the agents had been, had been infected and then were either recovered from it or uh, were removed. So there was only about maybe, uh, there were two or three agents that just never contracted it. All right, so this was one run of it. Let me run it another time. 
All right, so I haven't changed anything. I'm just running my code again. But every time I run this, the initial distribution of agents is different. The initial seeding of the agents, which ones are infected, is also going to be different. Their movement is different every time. Um, and how long it takes to recover is different every time. Again, I didn't go through the de all the details in the, in the code, but there's a lot of random things that are happening in the way I'm doing the modeling. Right, so we see time is going on here. And um, all right, we still have a couple agents that are infected. Maybe they will not infect anyone else, hopefully. All right, so it's still going. So probably the people down here are safe. So one person infected, hopefully they'll recover. All right, so the simulation is done. So we see I ran it another time. I didn't change the code at all. I didn't change my parameters at all, but we see um, a little bit of a different result. Now this one did run longer, so my x-axis is different than the first time. Uh, and my, but my peak infection happens to be about the same 65%, but this time uh, a little less than 90% of the agents were ever infected and then eventually removed from it. So all that random uh, stuff coming into play changed the results um, of my modeling. So let me just go to my slides. I have a little bit better uh, picture here. All right, so one, this is from another run I did. Uh, so let's just take a look here at, this is a typical time you run it. So if we look at that red curve, this does match at least the, the theoretical curve picture, kind of the cartoon we saw months ago about kind of flattening the curve and being really worried about what I have in my model as that red curve looks uh, qualitatively kind of similar to what we see that pr that without protective measures happening here. Now, uh, again, from the from what we see in the cartoon, there's no units really on the y-axis. It's just a higher per peak percentage becomes infected without protective measures, and that peak goes down. This is only looking at the infection rate. That's the the red curve in my simulation here. And so. It kind of looks like the theoretical model, the cartoon model that we've been seeing with, again, not having any real uh, first theory in going into the simulation here, just going into some idea of how people move and how the virus spreads with some sort of probability. Uh, again, if we run it one time and run it another time, here's two other times I ran it previously, we see that the results are different. The, 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 red the red curve looks different each time. The peak, the second time I ran it in this slide is much higher than the first time it only got to 40%. The second time it got to 60. Uh, the first time fewer people ever were infected. It's still maybe 95%, but it's 100% in the second time. All right, so that's, that's an issue we have when we uh, put random elements in our modeling. So how do we, how does this become useful if Every time I run it, it's different, and, and that is certainly going to happen with these random elements. Well, we, we want to, what we can do is kind of build in or account for that uncertainty or that, that difference that's happening. And we can do probability modeling there. So like I said, every time it's run, the results are different because of that, all those random things happening. So what we can do is run uh, something called a Monte Carlo simulation that's going to account for, I call them these kind of alternate universes. Every time I push run on my code, it's kind of a different universe where uh, just the, the initial values were a little bit different, the way people walked were a little bit different. So we can build a thousand, 10,000, a million of these alternate universes where the outcomes are going to be different every time because of the nature of using those random numbers in it. And what I can do is if I run this a thousand, ten thousand, one million times, I have all the results from all of these simulations. What I can do is kind of collapse them all down and get an idea of uh, having a, a confidence interval. So we can kind of say probabilistically, in, since we only live in one universe, what um, probability that do we have of different outcomes occurring based on running this in all of these alternate universes. And what we can do is we want to test, I'll show this well as well, we want to test for convergence, that we've run enough of these alternate universes that our print, our theory that comes of our confidence 
of where, let's say, what's our peak uh, infection rate going to be? Well, we're not going to know exactly, but we, we can hopefully get a confidence, a 95% confidence interval that our peak will be between these two values, but we'll never know exactly. And this type of modeling is used uh, anytime something random is occurring. So if we look at like weather modeling, this comes up a lot. This is, in, in essence, one way we're coming up with having a 30% chance of rain or a 40% chance of rain. Well, all these different models that we run our weather system through, about 30% of them said, yes, the rain path is going to come through this zip code. And 70% of them said no. Or temperature ranges, things like that. Are, are using something similar to uh, this Monte Carlo simulation. Right, so let's go back to the code uh, briefly. Right, so I'm having the same code, uh, more or less, but what I'm going to do is wrap these multiple simulations around it. So I'm going to be rerunning this. Well, in my live code, I'll do it 100 times, but in the prepared uh, code, I ran it, I believe, 10,000 times. So the more times we run it, generally, the better... Um, estimate we can get of what's going to actually happen. All right, so we can get an idea now. I'll, I'll stick with the baseline uh, that we were just looking at. So I'm going to say again that this is our baseline. We have a 70% chance of infecting people if we're near them within some distance, and we're still just kind of meandering around. Uh, let me make sure everything else is set up the way I want. Yes, okay, so 70%, and let's push go. Now, I'm not doing the animation this time just so it runs a little bit quicker. So what it's doing is I'm getting 100 of these curves, these SIR curves that we just saw. And what I'm going to do, it'll pop up in a minute here, is look at the, uh, from all of those models, where the 2.5th percentile of all of my estimates lie, and where the 97.5th percentile, and where the 50th percentile lies. And that's going to give me that confidence band that I'm looking for. Yeah, so hopefully this runs in real time. Uh, it runs a little bit slow. I do have it on the slides, uh, which I'll go in a minute to if this doesn't pop up. All right, I'll just go to the slides. Let it run, do its thing. Okay, so... This was coming from doing that same first simulation, but I did it here 10,000 times. So what I want to point out is, um, use the pointer here. Uh, now this is just the percent infected. This was the red curve in those plots I was talking about before. So from running these 10,000 models, the black line said if we did nothing in this original, from the baseline, that on average or the median was about 50% of our population would have be our peak infection. And we found that at the high end, the 97.5th percentile of our models predicted about, I don't know, 75%. And on the low end, about only 25% of our uh, agents becoming infected at the peak. So again, for every day, what I'm doing is I'm looking at all 10,000, across all 10,000 models and saying on day 20, let's say, what percent, what, uh, what's the lowest 2.5% predicting, 25%. What's the highest 97.5% predicting, about 75%. So we can say that between the green and the red band here, we have 95% of the models are predicting that that is the number of people that are going to be infected on any given day. This is not necessarily the best way to uh, to do this um, percentile modeling, but we can get a rough idea of what to expect in all of these alternate universes. Oh, and what I was showing here, uh, I don't think I'll have too much time to get into it, but I ran this enough times that the adding any more simulations didn't really change the results of the model. Right, so this is in our theoretical virus here, infection, what could happen? Um, but there's things we can change. There's some parameters that we in the model have control over that have some analogs in the real world. All right, so we can do some sort of mitigation. Uh, so like I said, we can change some of those parameters and we'll look at that in the code. So one thing we can do is that 70% infection probability that we started with, we can lower that by, by various means. Um, so for example, if we promote hygiene, if we say 
wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, avoid shaking hands with people, uh, make sure you're coughing into your elbow. Um, so, so simple hygiene things, uh, and also things like mask, uh, enforcing masks or people wearing masks. All of these things can, to some degree, lower that probability of if you're within a certain radius of someone that they're going to be infected. Now, the nice thing in the model is we can completely control this because it's just a number. It's tougher to know in reality exactly how much it, it, any of these efforts are going to lower it. Another thing we're going to play with is we can lower the travel distance. How, met, how far are these little agents moving? Uh, we can kind of simulate enforcing a quarantine or work from home by lowering how far any agent is traveling. Um, these are just some simple things that we can do in our model. Now again, real world par parameters, values are not known, um, but I'm going to show how in my model I'm going to include them. All right, so let's go back to some of these parameter changes. Okay, I did eventually run here. All right, so what I can do is I'm going to, in the model, assume that the first for the first seven days that we first see infection, that we have a lag, we are not prepared to make any sort of quarantines or we're making preparations there. We don't have soap everywhere or hand sanitizer everywhere. So I'm going to, in my model, assume that the first seven days, the infection rate is still 70% and people are still wandering around the same amount that they did um, are, are wandering about around a lot. And then what I'm going to say is here after seven days, uh, we are going to enforce a lot of good hygiene and masking. And in this kind of extreme case, I'm going to say that the infection probability is now going from 70% to 15%. Again, so from some, some uh, information I saw, these were some estimates about the probability of spreading COVID with without a mask and with a mask with 70% down to 15%, but there's really not enough good data to, to say that that's necessarily the case, but I want some numbers to play with here. Uh, and I'm also going to enforce this quarantine. This WD is making the agents move around less every day. They, they cannot travel as far. So I'm not gonna try to run this in real time, but we're gonna see what do these mitigating factors do if we run it through our model. And so if I enforce quarantine, so that's lowering how far every agent is walking around, and if um, and work from home, so that's the left uh, picture here, we can see that according to the model, these are lower. I'll have a comparison slide in a couple of slides here. But the percent infected, that peak, that median peak has gone down to maybe 25%. And the I'll say worst case scenario under these conditions is now under 50%. So this is if we enact these policies, and we don't let up until we see here eventually that the infection rate uh, always drops to zero, uh, given 180 days in this model. Now, what if we, uh, sorry, in the left one, I enforce that people walk around less, but there's no change in hygiene. There's no masking, there's no washing of hands. This model was still run with 70% probability of spreading the infection. On the right, I now played with it and I said that the probability lowered from 70% to 15%. And we see, and this is where we can see some interesting things about policy if we had a much more thorough model, that if we enforce quarantine and we force masking, the difference actually is not that much. Now, this is because no one's really coming into contact with each other. So the masking is kind of muted what its effect is in, in this simulation here. So we do see that on average, the peak goes down a little bit, but when we enforce quarantine, it seems like that's doing the most work. That's really um, lowering that average infection that we're seeing from the model. Now, another thing we can do is, well, eventually we need to uh, get rid of the quarantine. People have to eventually at least go to work, go to restaurants, do some small social things. So uh, in these two examples, the quarantine was never lifted, um, but in real life, it eventually is going to have to be. So what we can do here is according to in the model, uh, we can have another case where in my model after 21 days, I'm going to relax some of the restrictions. I'll do it two different ways. Uh, one is people are no longer quarantined. People are not working from home. I'm going to put that travel distance back up to where it was before the quarantine. And I'm going to say in, in one model, the infection rate will go down a little bit uh, because people are still probably 
a little bit more aware, they're washing their hands, some people are still wearing masks. But in one model will enforce like masking and hygiene, and the other one we won't, but we still assume some people will. So it will be lower than that 70%. I'll give it this 50%. All right, so, um, oops, where are they? Here it is. All right, so let's say on the left here, this is simulating we relax the quarantine, but we still are enforcing the hygiene and the mask policy. So relax the quarantine. Well, again, I picked 21 days just based on the previous data. So we are on usually on the decline here after 21 days. And we see that we released the quarantine, but now we have that hygiene, that probability goes down. Um, really, it's not too much different than when people were uh, quarantined and we didn't relax it on the previous slide, which I'll go back to. Right? So it's, um, or let's actually compare it to this because masking, this is quarantine and masking, and then we released the quarantining. Right? So we go from here to here. It doesn't actually look that much different, but in this case, we are still enforcing the masking. On the right is what happens after 21 total days, we release the quarantine and our hygiene efforts go back up to, again, not quite up to the original 70% in this example, but up to about 50%. Well, according to the model here, we're seeing, I think calling a second wave is not quite true. We were still on that first wave. We relaxed our quarantine policies, but at the same time we relaxed masking and hygiene policies for the most part. And we see that we kind of get this, this slump, it starts to go down, but then it goes back up again. And this is possibly where we find ourselves now uh, in some states that are not enforcing the hygiene uh, principles. I'll talk about some problems and some assumptions that go into this uh, now. All right, but if we at least compare from this model doing nothing to then quarantining and then requiring masks like the current policy in Pennsylvania, we see according to my simple model here, uh, a much improvement uh, when we did do that quarantine in, in, as seen by what's our peak infection rate uh, is much lower in our models, in our simulation. And actually, and also how many people were ever infected, the median drops below 50% in the simulation when we enforce quarantining and then relaxing that and then having masks compared to the baseline, just letting things happen, almost 100%. Uh, are becoming infected. Right, so I can go some, over some more of those details in the Q&A. Um, how can we extend this uh, just briefly here to make it a little bit truer? Well, if we had kind of agents gather around uh, certain points and not just wander aimlessly, that would be a little bit truer, truer to our situation here. If we have schools or concerts, things like that. Um, if we had selected selective quarantining, uh, we only quarantine people we know to be infected uh, and model it that way, we could see some differences there rather than just quarantining everyone. Uh, so reduce only their travel distances rather than everyone's and we could simulate what happens there. Uh, we could also incorporate, which I'll talk about in on the last slide, some lag time and uh, some asymptomatic spreaders, uh, putting those into the model. And what, is the mo what can the model show us is uh, through running a lot of different simulations, we could get an idea of when's the optimal time to relax some of our policies uh, in order to kind of balance the getting people back to life or back to their lives versus keeping people alive. Well, the model can let us in simulation set the, set the relaxation time and its policies to all different sorts of uh, possibilities, run it through the simulations and then get an idea at least of how that would play out in real life. All right, so uh, where I want to end my prepared presentation here is why is this modeling difficult? Um, why don't we get great results right now? Well, really the problem is we have right now for COVID-19 a novel virus. It's not been, it, we, we only know about it since let's say like November about. So there's not a lot of data. There's not a lot of scientific studies telling us uh, things like, what is that natural spread of the virus? How do we know if, if two people, if no one's masked and they're near each other, what is the real probability that uh, a susceptible person becomes infected? We don't have great data on that, unfortunately. We don't really know for this particular virus how, how well masking uh, does lower the infection rate. We know it for some other uh, viruses. We know it for some lab tests. 
but in doing some, some background research for this presentation, there's really no study out there that has great numbers for this. It, it almost certainly does something to reduce the spread, but the effect of it is uh, there's a lot of different uh, numbers out there from a lot of different uh, experiments though. Uh, and we don't really know is six feet enough. We don't have, again, good numbers on the amount of spread. So because of that, putting this stuff into the model makes it difficult because we don't have all that data. Another uh, difficulty compared to the model, we knew exactly who was susceptible, infected, and removed. We really don't know that now. So early on, there was insufficient testing. So we don't know how many people are infected. So we don't know where on the curve we even are uh, as far as the, the percent of population that's infected. And on top of that, the testing is, is kind of unreliable. There's a lot of false negatives uh, with the current testing. So we're not entirely sure, even if we have enough testing, exactly uh, what the real percentage of infected people is. So that makes it hard to make a forecast when you don't even know the current number of susceptible, infected, and removed. And we don't really know when people go from infected to removed either. When do they become not contagious anymore? Again, the, the testing is not necessarily great. We can get, for someone we know is infected and we test them, some false negatives from when they might have recovered. Or if we do an antibodies test, some of them have basically uh, zero reliability in, in what they're telling us. Some of them might be a little bit better. And depending on when we give the test, we really don't know when someone's recovered. And uh, again, another difficulty we have is, are the Rs, the removed or the really the recovered, really removed in a true, true COVID-19 model? In the modeling I was going through, yes, everyone who was R could not be infected again. They were really, had no bearing on the model anymore. But in reality, we don't really know this. We don't know how long necessarily the antibodies last. You might only be uh, immune for three months. Uh, again, not enough time has passed, not enough data has come in yet to really know, uh, can maybe for this virus, you can go from R back to S, uh, which would change how the modeling is going to be occurring. So with all these things, eventually we're gonna have a lot of data, a lot of reviewed papers are going to come in, but that can be months, years away until the real numbers are, uh, are in. So where I'll, I'll leave you with uh, for my prepared remarks here is um, the modeling is going to be, is certainly helpful. I mean, we, we need a way of forecasting what's going to happen, but with all of these difficulties of not knowing exactly all of these parameters or all of this knowledge, it's really tough to make very ironclad uh, predictions and forecasts with the model. And that's gonna be true with any nonlinear model that we're dealing with. Again, going back to weather models, climate models, econ economic models, they're all suffering the same sort of issue that being even a little bit off on a parameter or on uh, an initial condition can really make a large change in the outcomes that are going to come out of that model. All right, so with that, I'll uh, open it up for some questions and answers here. Um, I guess I'll stop sharing at the moment. Great, thank you so much, Joe. Um, Hopefully you at heard this me point, that it wasn't just on mute. Nope, you're good. You weren't just on mute. Uh, you know, as a statistician, love to hear some of the probability included in your modeling, right? Um, as an engineer, it's just it's fascinating that you know, um, you know, somebody with with your background, you know, could can can put this together and look at it from you know a totally different perspective than you know, say a a, um, a biologist would. But um, it's just it's fascinating to look at the modeling piece. Um, with that said, I just remind the audience, go ahead. If you have questions, um, please be putting them into the question and answer um, uh, comments here. And I'm going to turn it over to Sonia, who I believe will start the questioning off. Sure. Um, so, Joe, as you were talking um, towards the end of your presentation um, about the different models, can you share, like, who are the people or the agencies that kind of do this <laughs> and and more importantly share it with our leadership and and how does that all how does that work as far as you know <laughs> uh, sure so again this is not entirely or really not my field but as far as like the information i've seen it uh, i mean there's a mixture there's going to be universities that are doing like for example let's uh talk about uh, like how much does masking help well there's some studies where people make like 
basically a sneeze machine and put a mask in front of it or not. And they're using uh, some sort of bacteria or some other virus. And then they're swabbing five feet away, 10 feet away, and they're trying to come up with data there. Uh, but problems with that, at least that, that I'm aware of, is they're testing for like the presence of viral RNA. So if it's present 10 feet away, they say, oh, okay, there's spread 10 feet away. Well, that's not necessarily true. I think I'm going off on a little tangent here. It's but right. <laughs> um, They're finding maybe the viral RNA. That's not necessarily saying that it could infect someone 10 feet away. So it's kind of this, uh, so that's one example of, well, it's, it's a controlled lab experiment, or they do this sort of thing, even they go into hospitals and see, uh, go into a coronavirus patient's room, and again, are swabbing all the different surfaces to see right, where are we still detecting this RNA. Um, or there are, so that's one method is they're using COVID-19 probably, but the data is not necessarily true for spreading. Or we can go off of previous studies of I don't know, influenza, uh, other, let's say, viruses. And maybe there is good data out there for those, but that doesn't necessarily apply to COVID-19. So that's why there, there's, there is a lot of data that's not necessarily, not necessarily relevant. And there's some relevant data that there's not enough of. And that's what, with, any, with these new viruses, makes it difficult to predict. And then some of that is getting filtered, either done under the auspices or probably grants from CDC, NIH. And some of them are, I don't know, people just kind of uh, pivoting their research right now to try to get any sort of data, any sort of research out there that can hopefully be useful in, in some way of getting a better handle on some of these numbers. Yeah, we're a little bit of an instant gratification society, so I can see how this is really, really <laughs> uh, a struggle for us. Uh, yeah. So thank you. Uh, we have another question that popped in. Um, based on current statistics of the virus, is there an estimated time for when the disease will drastically uh, disappear? Uh, sure. Uh, I, in the, in the real modeling that's being done, the good modeling that's being done, I'm not sure. But as far as like this very simple modeling, now, I'm allowing for eventually, if everyone who recovers uh, is immune to the virus, well then yes, eventually every, it'll go through everyone and then no one can be infected anymore uh, by it. So something like, um, uh, try to think of a good example here. Smallpox is maybe not a great example. Maybe like 30 years ago, smallpox was a good example that people were vaccinated against it or they were recovered from it. So it couldn't really move through anymore. So that's another thing not being that's not in the model because it doesn't exist yet is like a vaccine uh, and maybe moving those people to the R category. Um, what we don't know about this, and I kind of uh, talked about this at the end is, can you get the virus again? Possibly, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, so some things are, I think due to the tests not being great, people who have recovered, some of them do maybe a couple months later, maybe they test positive again for the virus. Well, do they actually have it or is it just a bad test? I think those numbers are just really low and the tests are not that great. We don't know that yet. So it's, it's possible it never goes away or it mutates uh, and it becomes something like influenza, but that's, that's outside the scope of anything I really know uh, trained uh, about. <laughs> That's crazy though. There's like, there's so many possibilities that kind of makes me right. never want to leave my house again. Uh, <laughs> but but it, one of the other questions and audience, please feel free to submit additional ones. Um, can, can you share with us, like, how do we know that the models that you presented today are, are, are right or could be right? Or like, how, how do we decipher that? Sure. So I guess I'll, I'll say first, the model I made is certainly wrong. It, it's very wrong. There's, so, there's a lot of assumptions I tried to talk about up front. And it's not necessarily meant to uh, be a, uh, what I was doing, a, uh, a high fidelity model to COVID, but just how would infectious uh, diseases be uh, done? I want to just share, this is one of my favorite slides here, or I know, quotes, I guess I'll say, uh, whenever I'm talking about I use this in my system dynamics course um, as our first slide and our last slide in the course. So all models are wrong, but some are useful. So the point of the model is not necessarily, it depends what we want to do. It depends what recommendations we want to come out of our model or what we want to use our model for. It does not have to be 100% accurate. Uh, there's always going to be uh, assumptions made. There's always going to be simplifications made. Uh, 
are those things that really don't affect the large view of the model? Well, hopefully, uh, we're not necessarily sure up front. Uh, are there things that we're ignoring or that we don't know that we should be including that we're not? We don't always know. Uh, but the point is, if we're able to capture, hopefully with some fidelity, the general um, behavior of the system we're trying to model, we, even if it's not 100% accurate, or like here, we can only get maybe some 95% confidence interval of how it's going to behave, we can still use that to guide some decisions. Um, so actually, let me go to the other slide uh, here that goes into modeling. All right, so I'm not trying to promote Donald Rumsfeld at all, but this is uh, actually a great quote. I believe he did say this um, uh, in reality. I don't think he was just quoting somewhere else. Um, <laughs> this is all part of the modeling. I think it really captures it well. So there's no knowns. And, and honestly, the first time he said, I forget what year this was, probably like 2003 or four. It sounds ridiculous on the surface, but really it has in modeling terms, a lot of insight. Um, so like I was talking here, there's, there were known unknowns in the model. We know that we need to capture like the infection rate. We know we need to capture the recovery rate, but we know up front, we don't really know the values they should have. But then there's other things, the unknown unknowns. So something early on, maybe we would not have predicted. Can people move from recovered to uh, susceptible? Early on, we probably would have guessed, no, this is going to behave like most viruses where you get it and you're going to be immune for let's say a while, at least years, perhaps, or maybe forever. Uh, but it's very possible, we're not sure now, uh, maybe you're going to become susceptible after only a couple months. So if kind of there's still infected people out there, you could become reinfected. That would be, I would say, an, an unknown unknown in that, in that case. So, uh, so I guess in response to that, is, are any of the models going to be perfectly accurate? Absolutely not. Uh, we can keep putting in more and more things into the model that we're hoping we're capturing it, but we're looking to capture kind of the big, the big idea, the big scope to make any decisions. See, what's interesting is you had mentioned uh, weathermen uh, and women earlier in the presentation, and I just feel like we let them slide. Like, well, it's okay. Like, oh, they screwed up. Oh, they still have a job. You know, but I feel like the way that we're going to hold our other presenters of this information accountable. It's going to be because this has really impacted us. Yeah, a rainy day on a picnic is one thing, but this is everybody's lives have really been impacted on such a monumental level. Um, no, so that was, thank you. Thank you for your answer to that question. We have another one that just came in. Um, I've heard the White House today directed hospitals to input daily data to government databases rather than to the CDC. Can that have an impact on what future curves look like as in, um, maybe see politicized curves. Yeah, I think that kind of comes into what I was talking about. Uh, uh, it's parallel to the testing not being, at, at least early on, widespread enough. And even now, it might be more widespread, but not accurate, is anytime we don't know our current situation, we can't really model the future. So like in the model I was talking about, I knew I was seeding it with 5% of the population being infected. And then I was able to go on day two, three, four, based on that information. But if we think that only, now going with COVID, let's say if we think only 0.5% of the population, population is infected, and then we try to forecast our models forward, it's gonna be a much different estimate than if it's truly 1%, 1.5%, let's just say, that's gonna make a huge difference in is as we go out. And actually piggybacking on what you were just talking about, the weather modeling, in any of these nonlinear models, the further we go out from today, even with perfect, almost perfect knowledge of how today is, as we go further and further into the future, our certainty is going to become less and less typically with these models. So that's why like on a weather forecast, three day forecasts are actually pretty good. Uh, 15 day are basically useless. Uh, and then 10 day is gonna be somewhere in between. Um, and, and they are in, um, I guess I'll say inaccurate, but they're, they're highly variable for very similar reasons to this, is we don't have perfect information. Um, and it's a nonlinear model that the, even a tiny, tiny, I'll say mistake in knowing what's the, temper, the exact temperature today or exactly what percentage of people are infected today, even if we're off by, a, I don't know, let's say one percentage point, 
um, we could be, or 1% of the true value, it can really explode out in how inaccurate our forecasting is. And that's unfortunately just the nature of the type of problem. It's not that your model is bad, it's that's how nonlinear models work. Excellent, thank you. Great, hey Joe, I have uh, one last question here. Um, you know, we're seeing, you know, in popular media, you know, of course your model is not going to be put out. You admitted that this is very simplistic just to, you know, educate our guests here today about, you know, how the modeling process works. But we're seeing, you know, some models in popular media, you know, predicting here's the number of deaths we're going to have by this time. So can we assume or can you maybe shed light on, you know, maybe you know or maybe uh, don't know what what is involved in those models are they you know accounting for age are they accounting for um the travel you know are they accounting for different states having different restrictions um i mean can it can one assume that those high level models are trying to bring in a lot of those things that you have talked about are restrictions of your model yeah i would guess that uh an actual epidemiologist someone who really is into the modeling is going to be accounting for all those sort of things. They're not just gonna have a square box that people wander around in. Uh, that they're hopefully, uh, again, I'm, some of the policy, uh, some of the policy recommendations, let's say from the, the science class is coming, I would say some of it's coming from modeling and trying out some of these different parameters and seeing uh, based, on, based on modeling what seems to work. Some of it's coming from historically what's worked. So if we look at like the 1918 uh, influenza, I mean, we have some case studies there of states that uh, in, uh, enforced quarantine or masking versus those that didn't and, and what happened. Again, it's, that's an influenza, it's a different virus certainly, but there's lessons certainly to be learned from that. Um, and if we probably compare some of these more uh, conservative model estimates to some of the more less uh, more or less conservative less conservative ones i think some of that could also be well again there's been a lot of talk about like masking does it work like i said admittedly we don't know to the extent at which it does if we assume masking does nothing um then it's going to be a much different model than if we assume that okay what if 80 percent of people wear masks and it's going to cut the the probability you infect someone by half all of those numbers can vastly change what our predictions are going to be going forward. So unfortunately, we were in this kind of uh, bad place of even with a perfect model, all of our, we have unreliable and unknown parameters, unreliable and unknown current data. So no matter what we do, even with the best model, we have a lot of uh, variability in what we think is going to happen going forward. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Joe, for chatting with us today about modeling um, of infectious diseases. I uh, also want to thank our tech tutor, Connor, who's been standing uh, by just in case we had any technical difficulties, but all looks well on this end. So special thank you to all of you for joining us for today's Lionside Chat. As you click out of our webinar, you will receive access to a survey. Please do take a few minutes required to complete that survey. Let us know what your thoughts are about today's chat and perhaps offer some ideas for future chats as well. You are encouraged to reach out to us via email and remind we remind you uh, to keep checking our website as we are always adding new chats and we will be releasing August chats uh, very shortly. Our next chat to that matter will be this Friday, July 17th um, at 3 p.m. And it's a friendly introduction to the mathematics behind curve flattening. So I'm sure it'll be an extension of, of this modeling, uh, but really what's the mathematics uh, perspective behind uh, flattening a curve. So be sure to come back soon, meet with another faculty, staff, or student from Penn State Berks to share their experiences. Stay safe, Berks and beyond. Signing off until next time, this has been the Penn State Berks Lionside Chats.